Thank you, thank you. I need this table. There we go. Now we're ready to go. <laughs> All right. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, that was lame. How's everybody doing this morning? I know it's nine in the morning. I know you're tired. Let's wake up together. I'm going to say a quick word of prayer before I get started. <clears throat> Dear God, man, do I just thank you for this opportunity to come and speak to the church I grew up at, God. Um, ask that you would speak through me. Everything that I say today would be of you. Pray that everybody would um, hear what you want them to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So every day, all of us are faced with many different decisions. Like this morning, I had the choice to put on this shirt or to put on something that made me look a little less dressed up. I don't know. I also had the choice to wear red shoes. I made that choice. So for those of you that are in judgment right now, we can talk about that after the service. But we, we, every day we have to make decisions. And I recently just made a really important decision to propose to my beautiful girlfriend... Uh, her name is Emma. Thank goodness she said yes. So she made a decision to accept my proposal. And she is awesome. I mean, you can obviously see when we look at the two of us, uh, who is more beautiful between us. <coughs> um, that is clear. But also, Emma does an amazing job of making really important decisions. In fact, when we have to make a big decision as a couple... She always gives me really good advice when we're making these decisions together. But when it's a trivial decision, kind of a worthless decision, sometimes Emma can struggle, <laughs> especially at the drive through Okay? I asked her if I could share this, so don't worry. Does anyone have anyone in their family that just is the worst at drive throughs Just the worst. Yeah. Pastor Bob is bad at drive throughs You can talk to Darlene later, but anyway... So we go to the drive-thru. I take her to Sonic the other day. And I always prep her when we're going to the drive-thru. Hey, sweetheart. Uh, later on today, we're going to be getting lunch from Sonic. I want you to just make sure that you start thinking about what you're going to order. <laughs> so that by the time we get there, you know what you need. All right? So I prepped her. I'm trying to be a good fiance, you know, using sweetheart. Hey, sweetheart, let's work on that together. Okay. So we get up there, and she goes, Zach, don't worry. I always get the same thing every time. All right, great. If, you're, if you always get the same thing, then we're good. Okay, great. So we get up to the drive-thru, <laughs> and I order my chili dog, which I get every time at Sonic, which is awesome, by the way. <clears throat> then I look over at her, and she freezes. Does anyone have this problem? You just freeze? I don't know. It's like she sees the menu, you know how the menu, like, lights up, and she's just like, ah, uh, like, what do I do now? <laughs> and she always does this thing with her hands where she puts her hands like this when she doesn't know what to do. So she's doing that. I'm like, all right, Emma, I'm giving her the elbow. All right, Emma, you got to tell her what you want. And the lady's like, uh, are you guys still there? <laughs> Hello, is the chili dog going to complete your order? And I'm looking at her like, come on, tell her what you want. <laughs> come on, tell her what you want. Finally... She orders what she did every single time. <laughs> of course. Some decisions, we have to make them, and when we don't, it's just plain awkward. Like in this situation in, at Sonic, I'm sure for that poor lady on the microphone, she probably had no idea if we were still there or not. And it was just plain awkward for her. And some decisions are really important. You see, here, let me get this off. I recently made the decision in high school, well, not recently, made the decision to go skydiving. And one of the important decisions that I had to make when I, go sky, when I went skydiving was to pull the parachute. All right, so we'll get to that in a second. But as I decided to go skydiving, I talked to my friend, Andrew, and I said, Andrew, I think I have the most epic idea ever. And he's like, yeah, what is it? And I was like, on the morning of our senior prom, let's go skydiving. And Andrew's like, yeah, dude, that's a sweet idea. 
So as I tell Andrew this idea, <clears throat> it sounded really good in my head when I talked about going skydiving, but then when I actually had to like sign up to go skydiving, I was like, oh no, this is going to be serious. So then I went home and talked to my dad, and I was like, all right, dad, I need to brainstorm some ways to get out of this. <laughs> what, is a, what is a good way to get out of this decision to go skydiving? So my first idea was, maybe if I just stop talking about it, Andrew will just totally forget, right? <laughs> maybe if I just never bring it up again, he'll just forget that I brought it up, and I can just move on with life. So I tried this. Just stop bringing it up. And then Andrew brought it up every day. He started to become the champion of it, right? So then I was like, oh, no. What am I going to do now? So I came up with another genius idea. I was going to go on Google and look up stats as to why skydiving is a bad idea. So I pretty much wrote a book report on why skydiving is a bad idea. And I get, presented them to Andrew. We get to my world religions class. I'm like, Andrew. I'm going to list off some stats right here. One in three people, every time they go skydiving, something malfunctions. Recently in Minnesota, someone died. I'm just hitting him with stat after stat after stat. Andrew, we can't do this, dude. I don't think it's a good idea. Andrew's like, no, dude, don't worry. That's all baloney anyway. We're over that. So then I came up with my master plan. I knew this plan would work. If I, Because it was really expensive to go skydiving. So I told Andrew... If I tell him that I don't have enough money to go skydiving, there's nothing he can do. Like, what can you say to someone when they're like, yeah, sorry, man, can't afford it. So I walk in. I'm so confident with this plan. I'm going to tell Andrew, hey, dude, sorry, can't really afford going skydiving. And Andrew's like, dude, no problem. I already paid your deposit. <laughs> don't even worry about it, man. I already got it covered. <laughs> And that's when the realization kicked in that I was going to jump out of a plane. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my goodness. So that night, we got together with all the guys that were going. There's like five of us or something. And I made it clear that night. We were sitting around in a circle, around a bonfire. I remember it. And I said, all right, guys, here's the deal. If any one of you guys chickens out tomorrow, I'm chickening out with you. All right. If any one of you four guys say that you're not going to go, then I'm not going to go either. But if you guys all go, I will go because I'm not going to be the first one to chicken out. I decided that in my heart of hearts. I was not going to chicken out first, but I would chicken out second, third, fourth, fifth. All of those I was fine with. All right. <clears throat> so then we get to go skydiving the day of. My friends, we have to pick the order on who's going to go first. So all my friends are like, well, uh, Zach better go first because if he doesn't jump out, none of us get to go. So, of course, I got selected to go first. <clears throat> on the way up in the plane, this guy who's on top of me starts to explain. We're, we're doing a tandem jump, which means someone jumps with you, okay? So we, this guy starts to explain how many jumps he's been on. In fact, he's been on 1,107 jumps, he tells me. And then he says, after 1,100 jumps, I've never really had a parachute malfunction, so I think I'm due for my parachute to malfunction. <laughs> so I'm sitting there like, okay, this guy's parachute's going to malfunction. We're going to die <laughs> together. All right. So I'm, I'm thinking all these thoughts, right? On my left wrist, they gave me an altimeter. And on this altimeter, it tells you how high you are. And we were going to jump from 13,000 feet which is just stupid high, all right? 13,000 feet. We get to 2,000 feet, and I'm looking, out, I'm looking down like, oh, my goodness. We are high right now. So I look back at the guy behind me. I'm like, hey, uh, is my altimeter broken or something? Because it really seems like we're already at 13,000 feet. The guy behind me goes, Nah, dude, we got 11,000 more feet to go. <laughs> I'm just sitting there like, oh my. You know how when you thought that you were as scared as you could possibly be, and then all of a sudden that goes to another level and another level and another level? Every 1,000 feet we were going, I'm getting more and more and more and more scared. <laughs> then my friends, who, by the way, are loving this, loving this, 
ask me at about 6,000 feet how I'm doing. So I decided that I'm going to be super macho and give them like a strong thumbs up. Like, yeah, I'm good, dude. Don't even worry about it. I'm good. But this is how it came across a little bit. I was like, I'm good. Sound like a small child. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so again, I'm getting more and more scared as we're going. As we get to the top, the guy asked me to open up the plastic door. So I open up the plastic door, swing my legs around like you're hanging off of a dock with your legs just hanging in the air, 13,000 feet. And the guy's like, all right, we're ready. We're going to go on three. And on three, I was like, okay, we gotta, I got to prepare myself. Once three comes, we're going to jump. I'm ready to go. And as, we, as he opens the door, we turn around. He goes, welcome to my office. And I'm like, this guy's a nerd. <laughs> welcome to my office. <laughs> anyway, so I turn my legs over. We get ready, and it's like one, two, and we go. Who does that? <laughs> Are you serious? Who does that? Who goes on two? We said three. We had an agreement where we were both going on three, and then two came, and you're like, uh, nah, let's just go right now. I asked him later. He said that at three, people will clinch up and try to grab something in the plane, and that makes it, that makes it bad. So they always go on two. So if you ever go skydiving, no, be ready at two, not three. Anyway, this is me coming right out of the plane. And as we come out of the plane, I do a front flip out of the plane, and I see the bottom of the plane. I remember it like it was yesterday. 1-800 West Side Skydivers on the bottom of their plane. And then we hit what's called terminal velocity, which is falling as fast as you possibly can. It's about 120 miles an hour. And you can see here, here at terminal velocity, oh, There we go. <laughs> okay. Do you see my cheek there? <laughs> my cheekbones aren't that skinny usually, just so everyone knows. <laughs> okay? So at terminal velocity, we're flying 120 miles an hour, and I had to remember to pull the cord, right? I had to remember that I had to pull that cord so that the parachute came. Do you think I remembered? No, sir. I did not remember to pull that cord because I was freaking out and it was busy, crazy, and I didn't really realize that I needed to pull that cord. So thank God the Ninja Turtle on top. Doesn't he look like a Ninja Turtle? <laughs> a little? Yeah. Thank goodness that this Ninja Turtle pulled the cord for me because, man, would I have been in some serious trouble. <clears throat> this decision that I made was one of the most important decisions of my life. If I wouldn't have, if that guy wouldn't have pulled that cord, I wouldn't be standing here today. I'd be like three feet into the dirt, not here. <laughs> because that guy made that decision, I have the ability to speak to you guys today. You see, that decision that he made was very important. But also the decision that I didn't make was also very important. You see, when we have to make big life decisions, not every time do we have a savior ninja turtle to pull the parachute for us. Sometimes we have to make that decision completely on our own. There we go. All right. So today we're going to read from Joshua uh, chapter 24. So if you guys want to grab your iPhone or Bible or whatever you guys are using to look it up, Joshua 24. <clears throat> we're going to read from verse 14 through 15, but we're not going to read quite yet. So let's, I just want you guys to get there and maybe put your finger in there so you can remember that that's where we're going. <clears throat> but I want to set the stage of this first. Now, Joshua is one of the greatest leaders in the history of Israel, Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land. He had the honor to be the leader who takes the Israelites and actually gets them into the promised land. 
So Joshua is one of the best leaders that we see in the entire Old Testament in Israel. And Joshua has one final piece of advice to say. You see, he gathers together the Israelites, and he wants to say one more thing before he dies. <clears throat> Whenever a person is about to die, their last words are really important. Whenever someone gets the chance to really utter their last words, those last words are super important and most of the time really profound. They give a piece of advice that we absolutely cannot miss. So one of the best leaders in history, Joshua, gives us this piece of advice that we cannot miss. When I was reading this scripture, the uh, nerd that I am, I immediately thought of Yoda. <coughs> Bear with me here. Now Yoda was one of the best leaders within the Jedi community. Okay, follow with me. <clears throat> and as Yoda was about to die, he had some final wisdom that he wanted to impart on Luke. So let's, let's watch it together here. Underestimate the powers of the emperor. Or suffer your father's fate. You will. Young, when gone am I? The last of the Jedi will you be? Young. The force will fall. So Yoda gives this last piece of advice to Luke. Do not underestimate the power of the emperor, he gives him. And the music's playing in the background. Do, 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 right? That's how I see this with Joshua. Joshua is about to die, and what he had to say to the Israelites is much more important than even what Yoda had to say to Luke. Joshua has this moment where he gathers together everyone at a place called Shechem, all right? If you look into the history of Shechem, Shechem is a really important place in Israelite history. In fact, Joshua built a, a what, I don't know what you call it, a stone, a stone. He built a stone with all of the laws on it, which they could share at Shechem. Also, Shechem was only a couple miles northwest of where Abraham received the promise of God. So this is like bringing them back to Cleveland like LeBron James, right? Bringing them back to Shechem. It's the final place where they've been before. They know. Joshua's about to die. He's getting old. He has one more thing to say. He brings them to Shechem. And here's what he says in verse 14 through 15. Let's read it together. <clears throat> You guys read it out loud together, right? That's the thing. All right, let's do that. Joshua 24, 14 through 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away their gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Don't miss this part. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now Joshua gives this bold statement. And if we were to take this verse, if I was to grab my scissors... I don't know if I, I mean, I have an electronic Bible up here, but if I had a paper Bible and I was to grab my scissors and I was to cut this part of Joshua 15 out, it would make sense completely on its own. You see, this verse is even so popular that a lot of people like to put it on dollies. Some people even put it on a sign that sits by their neighbor's house so that their neighbors know. Others put it above their couch on typography, and it's for good reason. This is a verse that's really popular, and it's popular for good reason. But familiarity can breed contempt. 
If we know this verse so well, we can just breeze over it. That's the worry that I have about this verse. When we see this, but as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. We hear that all the time. Of course, yeah, my household and I, we're going to serve the Lord. No problem, of course. But we miss this moment. We miss the context of what was going on here. Joshua takes them to Shechem. He has one final piece of advice. And the final piece of advice that he offers is, but as for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You can see how the Israelites respond here in 24, 24 verse 18. They say, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. I highlighted we and our in this verse because it's not an individual thing. The Israelites didn't respond to Joshua saying, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take care of that, no problem. They said, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. It takes this experience from an individual choice to a communal and family effort. I want you guys to notice this. It takes this from an individual choice to follow God for you and your household to a communal and family effort. They've made the decision that they're going to do this together. Christianity was never made to do alone. If you look through the Bible, if you read through the Bible, the themes of Christianity all the way through promote doing Christian life together. All right? Now, I want you guys to don't miss that moment. And then if you notice this PowerPoint, it's all good. In verse 31, if you follow down, if you fast forward a little bit, it says, Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived them and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. <clears throat> These guys, after this rally cry that Joshua offers, they all respond, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. And they stick with it. For a little while, if you read the rest of the Old Testament, you see that the Israelites don't necessarily stick to it forever. Some of these guys stick to it their whole life, and that's what this verse is talking about. But if you look at the rest of the themes of the Old Testament, the Israelites have a lot of moments where they listen to God, and then a lot of moments where they don't. I think it's so easy for us. We have, why is it that we can have these defining moments in life and then forget about them so quickly? I think all of us in this room, we have a defining moment that we look back to in our faith story. For me, it was when I went to Nicaragua with Plymouth Covenant when I was in 2008, when I was an eighth grader and I had pimples on my face. I look back to that moment as a defining moment in my faith walk. And we, we all have those moments, but why is it that when we have those moments, we can just forget about them so quickly. Why is it that when we have moments that are defining and they're shaping who we are as a Christian, we can just forget about them like they're nothing? Why is that? It's because we need to make a strong commitment. A genuine commitment followed by supporting activities makes a lasting impact. A genuine commitment followed by supporting activities makes a lasting impact. Joshua gets up there at Shechem. He rallies the troops. He says, guys, I need you to make a commitment. Today I'm asking you guys to make a decision. And it's not trivial and worthless like Emma's drive through experience. All right. Well, that's just plain awkward that she hasn't made a decision. It's just plain awkward. It's important, like me remembering to pull the cord. This decision is one of the most important decisions that you're going to make in your life. And you have to make it. You see, the Bible doesn't say that you can kind of just walk on the fence and skate by and chill out. The Bible says that you got to choose. 
the Bible says that you need to choose and make a strong commitment towards whatever side you're going. You can't serve two masters, Jesus says in Matthew. <clears throat> Which side are you guys going to pick? What side for you and your household are you going to select to follow in the future? And once you make that decision and you've decided that I'm going to make a strong commitment until life do me part, death do us part, that's how it goes, right? Yeah. <clears throat> till death does us part, I'm going to make this strong commitment. What are the supporting activities that you've placed in your life and your household's life to make sure that this decision sticks. As we go back to verse 31, the Israelites put supporting activities in their life to make it stick. You see, sometimes in life, especially when it gets busy and we're flying at terminal velocity, 120 miles an hour, we can forget to put these supporting activities in our life. We just kind of throw things up on the wall like, and hope it sticks. Let's be smart and strategic about what are the things that we put as supporting activities in our life that's going to make a lasting impact. <clears throat> the first one that I ask you to do is make a commitment to go to church as often as you can. You're going to need to support your, the support of your friends during this busy time of year. Like I said before, it's a communal and family effort to make this commitment stick. We have to do that together. We have to. We don't have the option to try to do this by ourselves. When we try, in fact, when we try to do this by ourselves, in all of my 22 years of life experience, I've learned that when I try to do Christianity by myself, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. God created us as humans to be together and do life in community. All right, so we've made this decision. This is our supporting activity. Second, Find two prayer partners and pray together once a week. Everyone needs a prayer partner. When my youth pastor first told me this in high school, I scoffed. Ha! Like that's going to happen. <laughs> Joke. Right? You hear pastors talk about this all the time. Why? Finding a prayer partner and praying together with them makes a huge difference. It's one of those supporting activities that I was talking about that makes a huge difference in your life when you decide that I'm going to pray. Now, for those of you that have smartphones, who's got smartphones in the house? Smartphones. Raise your hand. It's cool. We can interact. Hands up. Okay. There are a couple apps that are gold when it comes to praying. All right? Gold. Echo and Prayer Mate are really good apps. Go to your app store. Maybe later, not while I'm preaching. Okay, while I'm preaching, that's fine. <laughs> Go on your smartphone, look at these apps, Echo and Prayer Mate. All right, I use Prayer Mate, and I use it every day. Prayer Mate is awesome because you can plug in what you want to pray about. So, like, I have, like, names of some of my students in my youth group. I have, like, people that are struggling at our church. I have things that I want to pray for for myself and my leadership. I have things that I want to pray for for Emma in there. And at 11 a.m., my watch and my phone buzz and say, hey, Zach, time to pray. You ready? Time to pray. And it always goes off at the most inconvenient time. Like, I'm sitting down in a meeting or I've got something going on. <clears throat> but it really challenges me in my life to think about it every day. These apps really challenge me to say, what are my supporting activities? If I've made this decision to, to follow God for me and my household, what are the supporting activities I put in? Remembering to pray every day will help this decision stick. <clears throat> Sign up to be a small group navigator, a host family, or make the decision to join a group. I grew up here at Plymouth Covenant. In fact, many of you were my Sunday school leaders, my youth group leaders. I know a lot of you guys personally. And your leadership is strong. 
Your leadership has led me to be who I am today. A big part of who I am today is that I grew up here at Plymouth Covenant. And a big part of that is the leadership of the congregation. There's people in this congregation right now that are sitting here that I know for a fact would be good small group navigators. There's people sitting out here right now that I know because I grew up here. I've been here since I was five. There's people sitting here that I know would be strong, awesome, God-loving small group navigators. Why not? Busy. We're going 120 miles an hour. Sign up to be a small group navigator. What about host families? I know, growing up here at Plymouth Covenant, that you guys cook a mean supper. (laughs) Seriously. I've been to so many of your guys' houses, and you guys cook a mean supper. Every time that you guys have the Leinberger family over, and we get to eat something, it's always good. Every time. If you have that gift of being hospitable... Why not decide to put a supporting activity in for you and your household to host a small group? If you have that gift of being hospitable, why would you not go ahead and say, guys, as a family, maybe we don't feel like we can lead, but as a family, kids, we're going to host a small group here at our house. Some of us, we're not even part of a small group. Let's join one. Let's get into one. I know. I I grew up here at Plymouth Covenant. I know you guys. Plymouth Covenant does church together. That is one of the most powerful things about this church. I've gone to other churches. I've seen how I work for another church. Plymouth Covenant does church together. In a powerful and profound way. As for you and your household... Show your household. Let's make this decision. Let's join a small group. Just like Joshua said that day. He offers a rally cry. He comes up to his group of people on the last thing he says before he dies. Hopefully I don't die later today. I'm only 22. Hopefully I stay alive for a while. But Joshua comes up. He offers this rally cry to make a commitment. Make a choice. You have an opportunity to make a choice, to choose what side you're going to be on. As for me and my household, I want to serve the Lord. And that's hard. we got to put supporting activities that sometimes can seem super lame in. One of the things I know, I'm a youth pastor. In the youth ministry, we need adults. We need adults in the youth ministry. It says, have you guys, there's a book called Sticky Faith. I don't know if any of you have read it before or not. But in the Sticky Faith, they did this study on teenagers. In this study, the statistics of teenagers leaving after high school is ridiculously high. So high that if you guys were to see those statistics, you would be alarmed at how high they are. Alarmed. Right now, people are walking away from faith after high school at an alarming rate. But if you look at high school students who had five mentors in their life outside of their parents, those statistics dramatically fall dramatically fall by like 70% or something. I know, guys. I grew up here. Some of you guys were my youth group leaders. And you didn't, maybe at the time, you didn't really feel that confident that God was really calling you to be a part of the youth group here at Plymouth Covenant. You made a big difference on me. You made a big difference in my life. Why wouldn't you make a big difference in somebody's life that's in the youth group now? 
Why not sign up? Join the youth group. Why not sign up to do children's ministry? Those kids, I, oh, if I had to do children's ministry, man, that is the hardest job here. I can tell you that right now. With kids five and under, I'm terrible. Something about my beard, I scare them. Okay, whenever I hold a baby, they grab my beard a little bit, crying instantly. All right? Some of you guys here at Plymouth Covenant held my sister when she was a baby. Took care of her while my parents got to go to service. What a blessing that is. What a blessing it is to look up at a dad like I have and see the experience that he shows and how he led his household towards Jesus. What an example. What an example for me as a kid to look up to. Look up to my dad, look up to my mom, and say they truly led their household towards Jesus. Now all I got to do when I have kids is get a, get a little bracelet on my hand that says, what would Bob do? Probably WWBD. I'll just keep it on my, keep it on my arm all the time. Hopefully, there's some things that Bob does poorly, like order at drive throughs But <clears throat> what an example. As for you and your household, what are you going to do? As for you and your household, what are the supporting activities that you're going to put to make that decision stick? I want to thank you guys so much for bringing me here to Plymouth Covenant. This was a, an amazing amount of fun. Uh, thank you for hosting me. May God bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. We'll see you guys next week. Good, but, goodbye. God bless.